Do we as friends dare to raise this question? God, why have you made so much use of law? Because if you take the Bible as a whole, which I've tried to do so many times as some of you know, it seems so clear that God's ultimate purpose in what we call the plan of salvation is not just to admit as many of us as possible to the uh, joys of the hereafter. He has a much larger problem than that. If he doesn't settle this war that began up in heaven described in Revelation 12, we'll be saved to live in a warring universe. I don't think anyone would want that. Much more important is the settling of this war, resolving this conflict in his family and restoring peace to his universe. Now, how do you restore unity in a warring family? How do you do it? Well, there are some leaders who will cut off hands and feet, gouge out people's eyes. This is horrible, but we've all read it in our history books, you remember? That's the way to get it. Intimidate everybody. And then no one will dare misbehave. God makes it plain. He wants peace and unity, not based on force or fear, because then everybody's still plotting rebellion again. You still have sin in your universe. He wants peace and unity based on mutual trust and trustworthiness, love and freedom and friendship. And how do you get that? Such qualities as that simply cannot be commanded or produced by force or fear. You say, well, God got everybody lined up after the flood. Well, he certainly, everybody was a believer in God after the flood, that's for sure, but that's why they built the tower. If you'd gone to someone building the tower and said, why are you building this tower? Don't you believe in God? He might have said, well, why do you think we're building the tower? We believe in God and we're terrified of him. We don't believe his promise. We're building this tower so we can be above the highest water level the next time there's a flood. See, that's the belief that the devil has. The devils believe and tremble with fear. God has shown his power many, many times, but he's never won love and trust and freedom that way. He's won respect. He sometimes had to move in to even retain contact with the human race. He was down to eight at the time of the flood and they weren't outstandingly good, were they? But to win someone to be your friend, there's no way you can do that by force or fear. You cannot order it. And yet, as you go through the Bible, you know how full it is of God's use of law. And much display of power and talk of fear and punishment and reward. And so we reverently inquire, God, if what you want more than anything else is freedom, an uncontrived, unmanipulated freedom, and you want our friendship and our love and our trust, why then the law? We should have been asking it all along. It's a perfectly legitimate question. And God replies, it was added. It was added as an emergency measure because you needed it. And I've always given you what you need. I'm your father, I'm your heavenly physician, and I don't want to lose a one of you, and I will give you whatever you need so long as there's any hope it will do you any good. And so I've given you the law to protect you until you come back and be my trusting friends and do what's right because you agree with me that it's right and not because I've said you have to and if you don't do it, you'll be in serious trouble. I want you to refrain from murdering your mother's-in-law because you agree with me it is not nice to murder your mother-in-law. In fact, you might even come to the place that you love your mother-in-law, but you see some people are only restrained from murdering their mothers-in-law because there's a text that says, Thou shalt not murder thy mother-in-law, and if thou doest, thou shalt be in very serious trouble. And if that's the only thing that keeps you from dispatching your mother-in-law, then your mother-in-law needs that law too to protect her, and you need it to restrain you until the day you might be converted and take a new look at it. Have any of you gone a whole year without wanting to murder your mother-in-law? That's marvelous, isn't it? I never wanted to murder mine, because sadly I never met her. She died just before. Do you need to check the commandment every morning, thou shalt not murder thy mother-in-law for thy mother-in-law to be safe? 
Or could you go a whole week without reading it and she'd be safe, maybe a whole year and she'd be safe because you're absolutely convinced that's not a very nice thing to do? Good, you haven't done away with that law, you've just located it properly. It's now in your mind and in your heart. How about locating all the rest of them in there? You see, when the law isn't on the wall, you haven't thrown it into the garbage. You have located it where it was in the beginning. The angels were surprised to find there ever was a law. They did what was right because it was right. That's friendship talk. That's freedom, trust, and friendship talk. It's a serious indictment of us and our behavior that we had to be told not to do any of those dreadful things that are listed in the Ten Commandments. I think, though, that what one has to be convinced of first is what God really does want in his universe. What is the quality of life God would give his own life to preserve for eternity? Have you read Ellen White's comment? God would rather give up the entire human race and start all over again than change the way he runs the universe. That's how much it means to him. Is that selfish? No, because he feels that way, this universe will be worth living in for the rest of eternity. He'd rather give us all up than change it. Do you want him to change it? Do you want him to run it this way? Well, the question is, how does he run it? What does he want? Or to say it in another way, what kind of person is our God? And how does he run his government?